Hello, and welcome to my channel. After years of watching hours upon hours of game reviews, I noticed a few titles that are never mentioned or reviewed by any of my favorite YouTubers. So after months of deliberation and years of studying the Blade, I have decided that it is time to throw my hat into the ring. This is the first in what I hope will be a well-curated series of reviews of games that made an impact on me over my life and that I don't think get the attention they deserve. Here is, uh... One of them. Lighthouse The Dark Being is a mechanical engineering and cradle robbery investigation simulator in the skin of a point-and-click adventure game developed by Sierra Online for MS-DOS and macOS platforms. Released in 1996, three years after Myst had completely turned the PC world upside down by proving that putting your aunt's wine country vacation slideshow on CD was indeed the pinnacle of gaming. Conceived expressly as a Myst clone, development reportedly began when adventure game juggernaut and mustache enthusiast Ken Williams, co-creator alongside wife Roberta of such smash hit titles as King's Quest, Police Quest, and Sad Boner Quest, or Leisure Suit Larry in some markets, called art director John Bach into his office, slammed a jewel case containing mist on his desk, pointed at it with two finger guns, and said, can you do this? To which I can only imagine Bach responded, Yes, yes my buddy. liege, and the desk exploded. Being that this would be the only game designed by Bach in history, I can only surmise that it did not live up to, what would have been at the time, Sierra's considerably high standards. While parallels can be easily drawn between Mist and Lighthouse, the game contains some significant differences in approach, most notably of which are the reliance on 3D animation instead of FMV, more character interaction, and a great deal more in the way of direct threats to the character's life, as well as a darker, more horror-themed tone to the game overall. Much of the game's appeal stems from the imaginative animated 3D puzzles which rely heavily on the player's understanding of mechanical systems, captivating world design, and a small but interesting cast of characters. I would strongly recommend anyone interested in tackling this short but engaging title take an introductory course in train engineering, submarine operation, and a few strolls through the Da Vinci exhibit at their local museum. While the game does have a fairly linear progression, requires some timing-based puzzles, and relies very little on moon logic to complete, a fair few challenges border on tedium to the point of wanting to rip your own skull off of your spine as if to ask if you have the gumption to progress to the next reboot era quality CGI modern art piece. Specifically, the puzzle box, which can be started very early in the game, and a lengthy section of confusing train driving in the game's closing act. It's clear that a great deal of time and effort went into creating the beautiful and often bizarre models that serve as the majority of the game's puzzles, though it is sometimes obvious that, as the game was created and designed by the in-house art director, the models were created first and then they asked, so like, what order do you want them to click on it? Now, I can tell the stories. The game opens with a brief 3D animated cutscene meant to take place on the Oregon coast during a dark and stormy night. An establishing shot of the titular lighthouse dramatically indicates that some kind of science experiment is taking place. You got your lightning orbs, strange blue illumination in the windows, intense church organs, all the trappings of a real late night 90s spook fest are in play. You almost expect the gatekeeper to pop up and yell something like, I am your worst nightmare. After witnessing our first kidnapping, we are dumped into the first-person perspective of our nameless protagonist. We quickly discover through a journal in the desk drawer and some voicemail messages that we are a writer who has recently moved out here to be inspired to pen their upcoming story, the process of which is not going well. Our parents are worried about us, our shady-sounding employer is becoming increasingly aggravated, we've got a weird neighbor of vaguely Eastern European descent who's neglecting his kid to work on his home meth lab, and frankly, this opening is hitting a little too close to home. After a frantic call from said neighbor, we are prompted to head over to the lighthouse slash meth lab post haste, and after a few clicks through the drawers in our living room, we hop in our classic Chevy to execute some low speed tire squealing down the coast to look after Dr. Crick's baby daughter Amanda. Upon entering the home, we are tasked with figuring out what has happened, but only after some brief exploration, the cries of baby Amanda draw us to her bedroom where, and I must admit, this terrified the absolute short pants off of child me when I first witnessed it, scaring me so much that all of the clothing on my lower half exploded off of my body, blasting through the wall and hospitalizing my older brother. The dark being first appears, snatching the baby Amanda before scurrying off into a golden glowing portal which collapses behind him. From here, it is up to us to determine what the doctor was up to and who the spooky naked man is, where they've both disappeared to, and how we're going to get them back.
This is probably a good place to take a break for spoilers, as most of what I've described up until this point can be gleaned from reading the wiki, or perhaps even, dare I say, the instruction manual. An instruction manual which I have personally perused. It's a quick read, containing basically the previously stated story beats and multiple descriptions of the controls of the game. Controls which are entirely clicking on things, or clicking on a thing and then clicking on another thing with the aforementioned thing. The description in the manual comprises several paragraphs, which in the modern day comes off as either a bit condescending or or akin to a lousy college student padding an essay to reach a specific word count. But in 1996, I can't imagine that this was even particularly novel. Like, point-and-click games had existed for at least a decade at this point. Anyway, go to this time if you don't want to hear the short plot of this game explained to you in excruciating detail. Are they gone now? Only spoily spoilerson still with us? Okay, perfect. Alright, so it should be pretty clear to you by now that this game is dealing with some parallel universe or perhaps wormhole type situations. Rifling through the good doctor's home, we discover through a series of strange alien objects and journal notes that Dr. Crick was working on a teleportation type device that would allow for the folding of space and time. By focusing energy through a lens, he was able to generate distortions in space-time that connected him to distant places or times via portals. It appears that his project was a success, but almost as soon as he was able to begin creating stable portals to another place, he caught the attention of a being from the other side. Unfortunately for him, this being was dark, and although reportedly mostly curious and harmless, it quickly became clear that this being had sinister intentions. At first, he would simply observe the doctor working, but after an incident in which the being... <sighs> Okay, I can already tell it's going to be annoying for me, and you, that I keep calling him THE BEING. So for the sake of both of us, I will, from here on out, refer to him as Ralph. So, after an incident where Ralph stole some blueprints from his laboratory, Dr. Crick constructed a cage around the portal to restrict Ralph's ability to freely move around the lab. This seemed to work out fine until one day Ralph opened a portal of his own into the doctor's house, the results of which we saw, and which resulted in a six-week stay and reconstructive surgery for my older brother, as previously mentioned. Though not not all of the inhabitants of the other side of the portal were as menacing. The doctor describes one visit with an amiable fellow scientist who we later find out is named Martin. This scientist would give Dr. Crick some information about the state of the world and some dire warnings about new dangers that had recently popped up. Warnings which the doctor did not seem to fully understand. Warnings that pertained to a certain Ralph who had been gallivanting around the lab for the last couple of weeks. So, following the kidnapping of the baby Amanda, we are able to deduce how the portal machine functions and open a portal of our very own. After stepping through, we are greeted by a pleasant but somewhat desolate world of rocky beaches. After some exploring, we discover a note from a failed expedition with little information besides the indication that it was likely to be their last. Shortly thereafter, we find a tower formerly occupied by Martin, the scientist Crick mentioned, and currently occupied by his skeleton and a mechanical birdman whom Martin had created as something of a lab assistant and guard. It appears that something had tainted the birdman, causing him to become violent and uncontrollable, resulting in the skeletonification of our boy Martin. After rummaging around in Martin's workshop a la Ralph, we discover that the Birdman was not the only thing he invented. Among the scraps and notes, we find electronic remote controls, a bat plane, a submarine, and correspondence with some cartographers. It looks like Martin's main area of expertise was in vehicles and tools for exploration. Learning how to repair and operate the bat plane, we are whisked away to its automatically programmed destination, a temple that we will soon learn is called the Temple of Ancient Machines. Inside the temple, we are quickly greeted by its keeper, a young girl named Lyril. Lyril serves as somewhat of an exposition dump in Lighthouse, as she is eager to speak with us at great length about the history and current state of her world in exchange for some pebbles and seashells. Lyril has been confined to the temple for an undisclosed period of time, although it seems to have been long. It's immediately obvious that she's been badly maimed in what she describes as an accident, leaving her confined to an electronic chair that is attached to a track that runs through the facility. This chair also appears to be keeping her alive and allowing her to communicate, although stutteringly, as wear and lack of materials, or perhaps knowledge of how to properly maintain it, is affecting her speech. She confirms that the note we found was written by the temple priest who had embarked on a dire mission to prevent whatever calamity Ralph was cooking up for the planet. Sadly, it seems they were the only other normal people left, and also her only friends, meaning that from here on out she would likely be alone with no one to help or protect her and the temple. Nothing but tears. Nothing but tears. During our time with Lyril, we are presented with a disc which informs us that this planet once contained a thriving civilization that was extremely technologically advanced. But as progress marched ever forward for them, the planet began to wither and die, the waters becoming polluted and the air becoming discolored and toxic, killing all the wildlife and almost entirely wiping out the population. Ah. 
it's always nice to be reminded that I haven't lived a single day in memory where the cautionary tales of how our unending sprint towards technological advancement is going to wipe out all the living things on Earth, and how those warnings continue to go unheeded. But I suppose on the plus side, I can now have poison food delivered directly into my mouth via my handy surf summoning app. After exploring the temple and pillaging its many interactive art exhibits, we return to the main chamber to find Lyril under threat from the violent Birdman who has likely followed us here to complete the task of finishing off the remaining threats to Ralph's plans. After thwarting the Birdman with the power of a big ol' magnet, Lyril now knows she can trust us and allows us to access the deeper chambers of the temple, where we discover pieces of an ancient weapon that the temple priests were building to stop Ralph, as well as the coordinates of Ralph's lair, likely the destination of their ill-fated expedition. We also discover that the priests had built something similar to Dr. Crick's teleporter, which is capable of delivering us directly back to Crick's house. We return there to complete the puzzle box that Martin gave him, and after a lengthy series of slide and button puzzles, we are rewarded with a small crystal jar. Armed with additional information regarding the priest's plan, we venture back to Martin's tower to seek out the wreck of the ironclad ship using his submarine. After figuring out how to free, launch, and pilot the sub, we head to the coordinates of the wreck of the ironclad ship and explore Jacques Cousteau style in the little attached mini sub. After much searching, we find a vault buried in the rubble that we pry open to discover a piece of the weapon. Back on board the submarine, we also find the coordinates of the island fortress. It isn't immediately clear who the owners of this fortress are or what its exact purpose is, but if I had to guess, it was some kind of military staging outpost used by the priests to craft and develop armaments and defenses in their mission to stop Ralph. Inside the fortress are several workshops and machines that can be used to fashion all manner of helpful objects. The whole thing is wind-powered and the 5G signal is amazing. Also inhabiting the fortress is some kind of ogre who stalks our every move and prevents us from entering certain areas by blocking doors and smashing our hand-built bridges. Hey. Real hard on that. Upon peering out of one of the workshop windows, we see that Ralph is also traipsing about, taunting the ogre with fish, and generally being a real asshole. On our way in, we noticed a fish caught on a line and grabbed it, so after some exploring and finding a hook on one of the guard towers, we concoct a plan to lure the ogre over to one of the towers, distracting him long enough to allow us to move freely around the fortress. Conveniently, as we are searching one of the adjacent towers, we discover a cannon, which is perplexingly aimed right at the tower we hung the fish from. Without hesitation, we load her up and fire away, killing the ogre in a cartoonish fashion. On the cannon tower, a key is found which opens up a compartment in one of the statues, providing us with another piece of the weapon. Having extracted everything we can from the tower, and with a few pieces of the weapon in hand, there is nothing left to do but head to the Dark Domain, where it is likely that the rest of the pieces of the weapon can be found along with Ralph's lair. This is also the most likely location that we will find the baby Amanda, Dr. Crick, and the Dark One himself, Baldi, the man of the hour, Ralph. Machio. Hopping back in the submarine, we make our way to the Dark Domain, whereupon we discover that Ralph has constructed his most diabolical machination, an overly tedious series of intertwining train tracks that can only be navigated using Elon Musk's boring machine. The Dark Domain demands of us the utmost in patience, memory, and patience again. Navigating Thomas the Tank Engine's personal hell, we find the baby Amanda employed full-time at a rock-breaking machine in a scene so creepy it will make you immediately forget to be disgusted about the child labor. After approaching Protracted series of train rides, lava diving, steam pipe retooling, and excavation, we find the remaining pieces of the weapon and free the baby Amanda from the horrors of having a day job. Upon constructing the weapon, we discover that it is some kind of dimension-bending vacuum designed to suck living beings into it, miniaturizing them and imprisoning them in tiny little jars. Coming to the end of a hidden bit of the tracks, we find the iron door to Ralph's. Before entering, we construct a time bomb from dynamite found around the mine and enter. Inside, we see Ralph literally pulling the final levers of his machine, preparing to open a portal and invade our world. Strapped to a table and ready to be violently electrocuted is Dr. Crick. We level the vacuum, and just before Ralph can throw the final switch, we suck that bad boy up into a jar feet first, I'll tell you what. Quickly awakening the doctor, we reunite him with Amanda and the blueprints for the portal machine that were originally stolen by Ralph before diving through the portal and chucking the time bomb behind us. Yeah! In the final scene, we find Dr. Crick and Amanda sitting by the fire. He tells us that he is done messing around with portals and will be destroying his machines and his research for good. He also instructs us to chuck Ralph into the ocean to ensure that he can never bother anyone again, which we do, and everyone lived happily ever after, except for Ralph, who lives eternally in a little jar at the bottom of the sea. It was perfect, and everything just click, 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 click. Lighthouse is a point-and-click adventure game, so it should come as no surprise to anyone that the main gameplay loop is pointing 
and clicking. The narrative is driven forward by completing various puzzles, the core theme of which being mechanics, and I mean that in the traditional working on an engine in the shop kind of way. While there are several traditional puzzles like the lament configuration box in Crick's study which contain a number of different challenges like a slide puzzle which will take you over an hour to complete, or even some classic adventure game tropes like waiting for audio or visual cues to click specific objects, it is fair to say that the standout puzzle concept in Lighthouse is the figuring out of complex alien machines and how they work. In my time with the game, I found that the most time-consuming aspects were not figuring out which items combine to create an effect, or pixel hunting with each of the items in my inventory to hopefully find the right item-pixel combination, but in mapping out and determining how the game's many machines' components affect each other, and this is core to the game's appeal. Playing Lighthouse for the first time, you will be spending a lot of time writing notes like, two left control key turns make the engine overload, and 13 cranks fill the meter, 14 cranks reset the meter. Unlike many other adventure games I've played, where creativity and knowledge of the story and items are typically the key to success, Lighthouse challenges you to learn schematics and determine how an entire environment interconnects to produce the solution. This can be a bit tedious as figuring these things out often requires you to move between multiple screens, performing trial and error, failing constantly, or spending time working out how the buttons on a panel that do nothing useful work. But if you have a mind for working out how the mechanics of complex machines work, determining the solutions to these massive puzzles is incredibly rewarding. While moments like getting the submarine up and running for the first time are fun and engaging, sometimes the execution misses the mark or can be so completely overwhelming that you will be driven insane. In the game's final act, this really comes to the fore, when you not only have to work out how a series of steam pipes relate to one another, but also, moving between the many controls and functional aspects of these pipes requires long and oftentimes confusing navigation by a manually controlled train system through a labyrinth of intertwining tracks, during which you can indeed lock yourself into certain areas of the map without a clear idea of how or why. Beyond the puzzles, the game sports an impressive 3D world for the time. The designs are incredibly imaginative and sometimes bizarre, but overall form a cohesive and unique combination of machines and nature that create a strong sense of immersion in the post-apocalyptic world in which we find ourselves. One of my favorite settings for any universe is anything that could be described as future fantasy. Settings like tabletop RPG worlds Numenera or Gamma World, where there are traces of high technology that the population does not fully understand due to some event bringing society down several pegs and back to the status of being medieval or even tribal. There is something captivating to me about people working with and relying on things that they can't fully understand or even maintain. It is a high-tension atmosphere, which in some cases manifests itself as an almost religious worship of the technology, hearkening back to the old saying, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. All throughout the world of Lighthouse, there are indications that the small, remaining population understand the importance of having technology, but with something akin to a fear of pushing it too far. A desire to understand how and why things work, while also never being sure if something they have created or discovered will be the catalyst for another event like the one that plummeted their world into darkness the first time. Much like the famous mechanical thinkers of the Renaissance like Leonardo da Vinci, much of the game's technology takes its functional cues from the natural world. The bat plane and submarine, which functions like a metal shark, are clear examples of how important it is to this society that any advancements they make be harmonious with nature instead of distinct from it. The music in Lighthouse is generally quite good. While many of the more horror-focused moments contain a lot of tropes like orchestral staff and church organs, the music of the parallel world is an excellent blend of synthesis and natural instrumentation. There were more than a few moments where I would just sit on a puzzle screen or staring at a pixelated vista taking in the interesting compositions. Anyone playing this game can immediately see that what makes it special is its attention to the quality of the art and music, which should come as no surprise given that it was created by the studio's art director. While the presentation of the models is, by today's standards, incredibly dated, and the models representing humans are almost laughably terrible. The environments and puzzles are beautiful in both sight and sound, and in my opinion, make slogging through some of the more tedious challenges entirely worth it. It is a well-realized world that will likely stick with you for a long time, as it did for me. If you're into that kind of thing. It was excrement. Did you say it was excellent? In its time, Lighthouse was met with middling to above-average reviews, dwarfed by the success of Sierra's other mainstain title. Mainstain? Mainstain Bears? Where's my coffee? Dwarfed by the success of Sierra's other mainstay titles, it was seen as a bit of an outlier. Many of the reviews remark that it was simply an attempt to rip off Myst, something even the developers themselves are happy to agree on. GameSpot would lament the obscurity and complexity of some of the puzzles, as well as how the ability to complete the game in a loose order can lead you to being places you don't have the solution for yet, as likely to turn all but the most seasoned adventure game addicts away from the game. And I can't say that I disagree. The game does produce frustration, and as a first-timer, the alien nature of the world 
world and lack of clear direction as to where you should go next can cause a lot of confusion and hopelessness. This is often counterbalanced by high praise for the design of the world and its elements, exemplified in a short PC Gamer review comparing the level of imagination on offer to a combination of HP Lovecraft and Jules Verne. Beyond a handful of reviews in the major gaming news outlets of the time, I struggled to find much more that writers had to say about the game. One print review in Next Generation Magazine gave the game two stars, warning the reader that they could have just as much fun with an old Rubik's Cube, which is indicative of this game's major shortcoming. The complexity of the puzzles will appeal to a very specific type of individual, while many will likely not make it past the game's opening, which is just as well, considering that the game ramps up the obscurity and reliance on knowledge of systems design to complete it as it wears on. Sadly, this also means that the majority of game touchers will never get to see the truly wonderful world that has been built here and experience the quality of the art and design that went into its creation. Ending your essay with in conclusion is bland. Lighthouse the Dark Being is a well-crafted and beautifully designed world that is dogged by its strict adherence to real-world mechanics. The game's setting is one that can't help but draw you in with eye and ear candy galore. It is overwhelmingly clear that the one aspect that makes this game most appealing is the art and music. Sadly, it is a world that many will never get to experience without significant levels of frustration and boredom at the overly arcane puzzles and repeated demands of trial and error or long hours studying brilliantly designed panels begging for some nugget of insight that will make it all make sense. When I first played the game after it was initially released, I marveled at the combination of horror, fantasy, and futurism on offer. I had simply never seen these things combined in this way before, but admittedly, I did not end up completing or even making significant headway into the game until revisiting it later in my adult life. While the developers must be commended for their commitment to creating an awe-inspiring and imaginative world to explore, rife with some of the highest quality 3D models models, and a live-feeling cohesive worlds seen in the genre at the time, as well as crafting the game in such a way as to give it a near-open-world feel, the difficulty of the puzzles and the requirement to complete them to move around between the sets is ultimately its downfall. As many others have already said, this game will only appeal to you if you enjoy working out arcane and complex systems. People who like rebuilding old engines or doing cryptography would likely have a blast with this forgotten classic, but for the majority of gamers looking to experience this gem, I would strongly recommend keeping a walkthrough hand lest you get trapped in the endless labyrinth of convolution on offer. Thank you for watching my video. I have plans to release more videos on forgotten classics of PC gaming soon, but if you have a game that you would like to see me review, please go ahead and leave a comment letting me know, and I might just add it to the list. Please also don't forget to like and subscribe so that I can be encouraged to continue this absolute shit show.